What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Arlington Draft House podcast. Today, it's just me. It's just your girl, Elena Torres. Uh, PD couldn't be here, but his loss. Uh, today's guest is a very, very, very funny comic. Uh, you can see him at the Arlington Draft House soon. Please welcome Mike Kaplan. Yay. Wow. Thank you so much. Let's have another round of applause for your host, Elena. Thank oh, you for having thank me. You. <laughs> I always do that. You know, in all my intros, like, I don't know if it's just a comedy host thing, but I, I always do that. Well, we got to do something when when you're starting a show, when you're starting a it's podcast, true. you know, when I do my podcast, uh, I often have on friends or, you know, sometimes people I'm just getting to know more comedians I know from out and about yeah. or whoever. Yeah. And we'll always, you know, as as you and I did, we'll yeah. log on if we're doing it remotely. Well, like, OK. And so we, we chat a little bit about what's going to happen. We have a, a normal human conversation. Right. And then I'm like, all right. And we're going to start in three, two, one. Hey, welcome, everybody. Yeah, it's yeah, time yeah, to yeah. do the weird <laughs> podcast boy start time. Yeah. By the way, that's exactly you described. You very nicely described that as something that you do. But that is what just happened right now. You and I were talking like regular people. And as soon as I press record, I was like, what's up? Especially <laughs> I mean, I I truly, I I only, I don't mean to call you out. I mean to call us both in. It's it's a I, I you know, I rem the I feel like one of the comedians who has solved this issue the most is and maybe other comedians out there if any comedians are listening uh, or if anyone w whatever the case is but jimmy pardo uh who does the podcast never not funny that i've been fortunate enough grateful enough to do a wow. number of times uh he has a system in place where i've only done it live i've never uh maybe i did it over remote once but when when i do it live you know he's in la they've got a studio they've got producers they've got a few they've got a team and when i arrive at the time that they ask me to he's not there and everyone else is just like have a seat here we'll do a mic check we'll do this and his seat is ready and he comes in the room you know at at the time that he wants to start and okay. we have no converse he's like oh i'm looking at your shirt and that thing and we're going to talk about uh quick and just immediately into the podcast so there's there's no artificial you know separation of podcast and not podcast it's there's he's not there and then he it's podcast <laughs> Yeah, that's actually a really, really smart way to do it live. Because also, as you're talking, like, I remember we had Bobby Lee on this podcast, and I was like, he's really good at podcasting. And then I started listening to their podcast, and they just don't really do an intro. They just kind of like put the music in the middle of wherever, like, the intro, wherever the conversation sort of like wherever it works. And that is very yeah. successful. I love, I listened to a lot of Pete Holmes's podcasts uh, over the past many years. Very love comedian of you, by the way. All <laughs> comedians. I don't know what it is, but comedians love Pete Holmes's podcasts. I mean, well, uh, number one, I I think Pete has like wonderful guests and who aren't yeah. even just comedians. Like I listened the most recent one to his, uh, he had the guest Byron Katie, who is, you know, a, a spiritual teacher of sorts, like for- okay. Uh, lack of a better. Uh, she wouldn't necessarily call herself that, but she's, you know, a person who had an experience of a kind of waking up and offers uh, kindness and uh, and just this beautiful, it's hard to even talk about, but I, I love her writing. I love her work. And I was like, wow, he, she, she's on his podcast. You know, he has like uh, many different spiritual teachers and things. So, but I love Pete. And I, here's the thing that I love about the way that he starts is like, you know, they, I think his addressing of this issue is they sit down and have a conversation and uh, when people arrive and it's just recording the whole time. I think it's recording yeah. when people get there. And I wonder, it would be fun to see a supercut of all the number of times that people are like, oh, have we already started? Oh, ha is this, we're recording? Oh, this is, is this the podcast? Yeah. It's like, yeah, just to not, not miss any one drop of that juicy pod conversation. Yeah. Uh, the real human interaction as it were yes uh and the other thing i was gonna say is i i yeah i don't i guess i assume people love pete's podcast. if are you saying that people who i mean i'm sure that pete who people who aren't comedians also must love well yeah yeah, yeah 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 obviously it's not just a podcast there aren't enough of us for it to be as as successful as, as it is but just something i've noticed 
like when you talk to other comics in general about what podcasts they listen to, particularly like comedy podcasts. Yes. So many comics. That's actually like why I started listening to Pete sometimes is because so many comics are like, oh, I really like and listen to Pete Holmes's. And then I had I had one conversation <laughs> with a comedian that said, how do you feel about Pete Holmes's podcast and his comedy shows like where you are in your journey of comedy? Ah. Uh because like usually it starts where like you don't like his comedy that much and then you really hate it and then you start to really like it and then you really respect it and when you hit that really respect note of Pete's comedy that shows that you're a better comedian for some reason that's really interesting uh it personally doesn't specifically resonate with my journey because I as far as I know I think I've always liked him in his comedy yeah. though it it has i did go through a period where when i would listen to his podcast i would be i would feel jealous during the intro when he was talking about all the places that he was about to perform oh, yeah. like, i, I want to perform at those places so yeah. but even if i'd just been to one of those places i'm like i want to go back there tomorrow yeah. uh but uh, now I'm, I do my best to uh, either skip the intro or be, I'm, I'm glad that Pete is working. I'm glad that yeah. he's getting to go to all those places. It doesn't take anything away from me that another comedian, it's actually probably better for me that a comedian, that good comedians are performing in so many places that yeah. there are so many opportunities that like, if nobody was performing anywhere, then I wouldn't be performing anywhere. Right. That, well, that's just spiritual greatness just to not be, it's a, it's easy in this game to get really jealous. And I've gotten, the longer I do comedy, like the better I've gotten at that, but I'm definitely not it, great at it, it yet. Yeah, it's, I always, I do my best to uh, remember now that I've been doing comedy over 20 years and there's, I've, I'm very grateful with many of the opportunities that I've yeah. uh, gotten and the accomplishments that I have uh, experienced. And so I know for sure there are many people who could look at objectively the things that I have done. Uh, and want to be where I am. And of course, we're always, we never reach the horizon. There's always another, once we get to the goal, we're like, well, I'm still alive. So what, yeah, is, yeah, yeah. what is the next goal? There's, do you ever read things on the website Quora? Do you know that website? I do. I, it's like, it's a forum mainly, right? I feel like whenever I'm like Googling how to fix my coffee machine, it yeah. comes up. Yeah, I think that Quora means like, I think, it's like a question forum so a quorum but maybe plural so many question forums or fora yeah. i don't actually know i might be making this up we should look it up on quora but there was one uh one that really sticks with me an answer to a question somebody asked i think the questions are often the ones that i get you know sort of sent to me uh in my inbox just i don't know if it's the algorithm or me or whatever but uh there are so many weird questions like so many about sociopaths so many about uh just things I'm like why is this is this is this what everyone's asking or is this for me am i yeah. okay but how do i know and but one question that I really liked was somebody wrote in, how, what's it feel like to be, what's it like to be a genius? And <laughs> the, the top answer was I, something I really liked. A guy wrote in and was like, now I don't, con he's like, first, I don't want to, I don't want to say that I consider myself a genius. Okay. Uh, but he's like, I've been working and I'm saying he, I think it was a he uh, based on the name, but just, okay. I'll say they from now on. Okay. Uh, this person, they, uh, they were like, I've been working in my field for 25 plus years and I've, you know, reached these sort of measurable, uh, you know, accomplishments, these goals that I've achieved that people are wow. like, people tell me that I am, you know, I, I, there are objective markers of success. And so I don't think of myself as a genius, but I, the way that I conceive of my work is that ahead of me, I see impossible problems and I work on them for a long time and then I hopefully solve them. And then once I've solved them, I don't think, hooray, I've solved an impossible problem. Then after I've solved it, it just becomes a thing I did. Like, yeah, 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 of course. And like now yeah. next impossible problem, please. Yeah. And so I feel like that's the way I feel. I mean, I do my best to, and it's often nice to reflect with other people when they're like, wow, you got to do this and that and this, and that must've been great. It was great. And, but then 
the question I, I try not to think of in this tone, like, but what have I done for me lately? You know, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. but there, it's, it's both. It's like, you know, gratitude and ambition are, you know, valuable, a valuable yin yang to hopefully uh, keep moving forward with. Yeah. And my, so, you know, as someone who's been in comedy for a long time and you've done a lot of like the big comedy milestones that we all think about, you know, as, as something important in our careers, but what's something that you did or something that happened in comedy that ended up being way more rewarding than you expected? Uh, sure, thank you for asking. It's, uh, that's a good question. And when I say that's a good question, sometimes that means I don't have an immediate answer. So uh, I have my mouth going while my brain is working on it. I will say, uh, the very the first biggest thing that had an impact on my career that I did was about eight years in, I did Last Comic Standing uh, in 2010. And I remember talking to, I had a manager at the time that I just started working with, and we talked about like whether it would be a good thing for me to do, like whether I want to do or we thought it would be good. And he was like, I don't love the show is like, and just in the, in the idea of like competitions, aren't great reality shows, uh, you know, have, yeah. uh, their own potential baggage and connotations. He's like, so, uh, yeah, I don't know, but you might win. So why not? And ultimately, you know, whenever people consider like doing shows like that, uh, if they ask me for advice, I'm always like, well, usually the worst thing that happens is nothing. Like the worst yeah. thing that happens for almost anyone who goes on a competition show is that the day after your life is the same as it was before, basically. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, totally. Like, and people are worried about like I went on it actually two years earlier uh, and didn't advance like before the, the time that it worked out really well. Uh -huh. And I went on and I, you know, it was eliminated in the like producers liked my two minute set. And then they were like, do it for the judges. And the judges like stopped me. And then I was actually included in one of my jokes was about, it's like, briefly, the joke is, uh, I was on a plane and this baby wouldn't stop crying because I wouldn't stop punching it or something like that. Okay, okay. Uh, like, and I don't, I okay. don't stand by that. I don't think it's the best. I definitely don't think it's the best joke I've ever written. It's, there's a joke logic to it. <laughs> Yeah, we, uh, we all have, I mean, no judgment. <laughs> and this is like, you know, 15 years ago yeah. as we speak. Uh, and so I'm- I, I think you're I think, canceled for that. <laughs> <laughs> and like, good. you know, I, I, I truly like legitimately wouldn't tell that joke today right. without disclaiming and being like, I was young. It, it was a different time when yeah, you yeah, could, yeah. when you could talk about punching babe. And, you know, it was obviously like, my intent was for it to be absurd and like, quote, yeah. just a joke. Yeah. Uh, and it was included in a segment on the show called like, don't do this or something like, oh, really? you know, <laughs> things to avoid. Like, right, they just, right, right. and they had, they were like, you know, listing, don't do this, don't do that. And they're like, don't joke about babies or something. Okay, yeah. And it was, it was that joke by me. And then there was another joke by Carmen Lynch and one by Gina wow. Brian, who are both, you know, also, hilarious, right you know, yeah. working, successful comedians. Right. And I think we all were doing fine at the time. Like we were all like professional comedians, right. but the way that that show worked, they were just like, look at these people trying out and telling us that they, they don't like babies in some way. And one, so one beautiful thing about that was that because I was a professional comedian, I wasn't yet in SAG after I wasn't in the union, oh. uh, for being on television, but I had done one television thing before that. I was just on live at Gotham on Comedy Central earlier that year. Uh -huh. And you can, I, my understanding is at the time you can be on TV once uh, and I could do that without joining the union. But if I did a second thing, I would have to join the union. Yeah, yeah, and, it, was like two or, it was like two or three. That's how, that's how I got in the union, yeah. And so when I was on Last Comic Standing, they. The weird thing is, if you're not in the union, they don't pay you. They're just like, you're just a person standing in line. Ah. But if you are in the union, they pay you. So I went to the union and I was like, hey, I was, 
I, I had this one TV thing and now I have the second one, but it's only it only counts if I'm in the union. So can this make me join the union and thus you get me because the show didn't want to pay me because they're like, you're not in the union right now. But I'm like, right. but aha, what if I am? And yeah. so the union was like, yeah, you should be. And you pay us money to join the union and we'll get you that money from the show. And so that's how I became, you know, technically, and because there's no comedian union, this is the closest that we have uh, for a performer's union. And so that was one. And so the, the question that you asked about, you know, what, I don't know if that was like rewarding. It was rewarding in a, certainly in a financial way, also yeah. kind of in a psychological, emotional way to be like, oh, now I have another notch in the, I'm officially a professional comedian belt yeah. toolkit. Right. And and then uh, I mean, but then the, originally I started telling the story because doing Last Comic Standing in 2010, when I advanced to the finals and then got to tour with the top five. And that was the first time that after that people started coming to see me because they knew my name, because they wow. had seen me on TV. They weren't just coming to, you know, comedy club for the weekend. Right, they, right, right. And so that was like the biggest uh, the biggest leap, you know, as I feel like there's so few literal overnight successes, you know, like someone's like, wow, uh, this person, you know, yeah. how, how long have they been? Oh, they've been doing it 20 years before they were a new face or, totally. you know, yeah, yeah, totally. I know a lot of new faces in comedy, you know, that'll get like in the Montreal new faces of comedy. I'm like, I think that person's been in the game for like 15 years, but okay. Yeah. yeah. And so that, that was the largest, you know, actual, you know, non-gradual step you know they're still in a sea of gradual steps uh that experience which you know i was i was happy to do and very grateful to get the opportunity and now i'm happy to not need to do things like that though also you know somebody was like hey you want to come on i mean there's now now a show the great american joke off that yeah. a bunch of great comedians are doing and it's right. it's always nice to be asked to do things and it's also always nice to be able to forge one's own path and which you know sort of the democratization of the internet offers so many comedians right. now to not need montreal and not need the tonight show and not need any specific path to just be like i'm funny here's a podcast here's a web series here's a yeah. my live shows here's social media here's whatever uh so that i think is an answer to your question okay that's a, and it, you know, in, in a way that like you didn't expect sounded like, right? Like you were just like, I'll just, I'll do this, whatever. Yeah. And it ended up paying off way more than you thought. Yeah. And I mean, also, I, I feel like the real ultimate answer is that like, I, here's, here's a, I think a better, here's a better answer. Here's another, here's another answer. These answers, okay. they're both my babies. I, they don't need to compete. I love them both. Okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, in, in tw about seven years ago, I started, I met uh, the woman who is my girlfriend now. Uh, her name is Rini. I love her. Uh, she is the best. I'm sorry to everyone else out there who thinks that their partner might be the best, uh, but your partner might be the second best. Uh, she is, uh, this is the only thing that is, a, I mean, it's, she's not competing, but uh, she is the best. And like my life changed, has changed so much as a result, like my inner life uh, as a result of this relationship. And also sort of in that time, I don't think it's a coincidence that, uh, and she is not the only factor. Like I also started meditating in the past 10 years. I also uh, discovered uh, ayahuasca ceremonies in the past 10 years. I uh, made a really good friend who is a practicing Buddhist and I've been learning a lot about Buddhism in the past, uh, probably like five years or so. And, but my comedy, I would say like 20, you know, 20 years ago when I started, I was just like writing individual jokes that didn't really, you know, like jokes like that baby one, like some right. of them were about things I cared about. Some of them were about things that I didn't that much. It was like, whatever's yeah. funny, whatever audience, what do you like? We want, yeah. you want something, you Whoa. want a joke? Yeah. What, what do you like? Yeah, I'll, I'll do what you want. Um, and in 20, 18 i went to the edinburgh fringe fest uh for the first time and uh, i'm looking forward to returning this year but uh the show that i was working on there was like the first show that it was really during you know this psychedelic spiritual experience of an ayahuasca ceremony that one time i was like what if i did a show that was all about the like you know i don't know uh 
love, you know, just to be to yeah. be general, but to be love and kindness and compassion and not murdering and things that I care about, like, right. you know, immensely the main the main thing that I care about. And that was a show that I did over there called uh, All Killing Aside, which became the most recent album that I recorded, a.k.a. And doing that experience of like bringing that show to Edinburgh and like really working on one theme uh, was something that I never thought I would do. Uh, and also actually kind of like ties into like so many aspects of my life. Like in, I was married in my twenties and I, we divorced and I, I don't know if this is a, a thought that a lot of people have, but when I, my monogamous marriage didn't work, I was like, maybe monogamy is not for me. You know, like so frequently, yeah. uh, people in, I feel like have the other experience. You hear about an open relationship failing or people having a threesome and it screws things up right. or, you know, people trying polyamory and being like, uh, but uh, you, you only hear about it for the most part when it doesn't work. You don't hear about all the, the people who are, especially, you know, where it's stigmatized in society and that's changing oh. and that's great. But, yeah. you know, if people are happily open, happily non-monogamous, happily ethically non-monogamous, uh, not everybody is, you know, uh, shouting it from the rooftops. So you only, you get a, you know, a, a distorted view of things not working. Meanwhile, Absolutely. how many monogamous relationships don't work, but some people are like, oh yeah, openness, tried it, didn't work, never mind. But right. that's what I did for monogamy at first. I was like, yeah, this woman who I got together with and married and got engaged in less than a year when I was 25, it's monogamy, the whole system that's the yeah, problem. Yeah, yeah, I hate all of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, but here's the thing that I feel like, I don't know that I've even explicitly made this connection. Uh, this is an exclusive here on this podcast right now today, uh, unless I did think about it and forgot. But one of the reasons that in my 20s, I was like, I don't know if a lifelong commitment is right for me. Right. Uh, I was like, what if I meet? There's so many people I could meet. There's so many people. Who knows what's out there? Who knows what it could be? And I feel like that sort of matched the way that I was writing jokes as well. I'm like, all of the jokes, all of the people, all of the things got to maximize. Because look, if you leave some out, but now the same way that I have like committed uh, monogamously to Rini and that we have this beautiful life together that I love so much, I have also in ways like done that in my comedy like this is like what if i have only one topic that i'm like going to dive into and dig deep down in because i used to probably i was afraid like people you know like mike birbiglia was one of the first comedians in america that i feel like was successful and famous for doing one man shows right. you know like be right. before nanette before like so many people and before like you know the the british model and the australian model like and the edinburgh right. fringe model where so many comedians are doing that making these right. you know beautiful one person shows right but in america it was like you know and especially in boston where i was starting out there were so many comedians that was just like joke 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 just jokes right. just yeah that's what comedy is is joke and comedy isn't just one thing of course and if you I, I, there are so many comedians that do just tell, like Mitch Hedberg is one of my first favorite comedians and he didn't have a narrative through line, but he was brilliant and wonderful. Yes. And famous for not having segues and just doing joke, 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 joke. Yes. Yeah. Wasn't talking about his personal life and, right. and who cares? I mean, it would have been really interesting if he did, but also like and Stephen Wright, like nobody, yeah. like, I mean, you can learn about his life if you want to, but he's not. Right. He's not giving you his biography in in his right. comedy, and that's not required. And so when people, when I was starting out, I, I liked Mike Birbiglia, and people were like, "Do you think you'll do something like that?" And I was like, "Absolutely not." I mean, I mean, or at this point, I can't even imagine because I'm just like building things from the ground up, like one snowflake at a time, and putting them together until eventually it's like an ice sculpture of some kind. Whereas other people seem like they're starting with these massive blocks of ice and chipping away things, and like this is the story I want to tell, and you know, it took me at least, you know, I started in 2002. It was, at, you know, more than a decade, decade and a half before I, it sort of naturally occurred to me that I don't have to be at the whim and mercy of just whatever thing I think is funny in a particular moment, a sign that I see or a conversation that I have. Like, 
I really do. I do think that this it's not as simple as this. And it's uh, this might not apply to every comedian. But I feel like there's a spectrum of like some comedians really start out knowing what they want to say. And then over the course of time, figure out how to say it like structurally. And then some comedians, I think, and myself among these start out with structure. Like I was writing like structured jokes from the beginning that were like, you know, some of them were good and many of them were not. But I, I was saying like, I didn't specifically know I was, you know, uh, in my early 20s, mid 20s, like I had a a decent, like, you know, a sort of sheltered childhood. Uh, I like I didn't have a lot of, you know, traumatic experiences. I I didn't have a lot specific. I didn't know what I had to talk about at the time. You know, like some people knew what they wanted to say. I just knew that I wanted to say. And so for me, I eventually through the course of, you know, years and years of living and growing as a human and a comedian, I started out with the form and then eventually was able to apply the function like, oh, I could talk about there are things that I care about. There are things that I think are meaningful in my life and in the world. And so I feel like that that experience of, you know, again, like psychedelics, meeting my wonderful partner, uh, thinking that I could do this thing. I'm like, why not try it now going to Edinburgh and now having this whole new world of, uh, of possibility open to like, Oh, I mean, and it's not like I still write jokes and like, I've actually done a couple albums in the past year that I just called live in between albums and live in between albums too, where right. it's like jokes that don't fit in the theme of, you know, that theme or the next theme or the one after that. Right. And so I kind of feel, uh, you know, super uh, like lucky that I, I mean, I, I, I can do, I can do whatever I want. And that was kind of always true uh, with respect to, you know, the kind of comedy that I was making, but I like the world is really the world of my, of how I'm doing comedy has really opened up in the past uh, at least five years to a little more than that for. And so I think that that, that was a really rewarding thing that I also didn't plan for and right. didn't see coming. Uh, but it all sort of came from and it, the initial impulse to say yes to everything of like, you want to do this show? Yes. Got to drive three hours to do a five minute open mic. Yes. Do, you know, fly to, I flew to Seattle four years into comedy to do the Seattle comedy competition, which they were like, if you make it out of the first round, you get 500 bucks. If you don't, then you don't get anything. And you know, it cost me more to get there than even that. But right. I was there for two weeks and I met people and it like that, that was like, you know, you never know in the beginning, like, do you know the, do you ever watch The Price is Right? I did. Do you know the game Plinko? I don't remember. It's been a while since I watched it. Sure. So I'll, I'll remind you, or it's very simple. Plinko is like, there's these discs, these circular discs that, and there's like a, a pegboard of a kind. And mm -hmm. at the bottom, there are places where it can land that's like, you know, a thousand dollars, five thousand, ten thousand, a hundred, right. five, and then you and there's these pegs sticking out, and you drop this disc at the top, and it bounces and you know yeah. goes I from know place to place, plink, 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 and then it lands in one, and you get a couple right. of those, and if you get it in like the you know the the top money one, then you try to do the exact same thing that you did before, but you can't control it. You can't. Right. You have no idea, and so I feel like my comedy career and I think everybody's career is like that. Like when it's once you've achieved it, when you're looking back on how it happened, you're like, oh, wow, like it couldn't have happened any other way. But when you're telling someone like from the beginning, like, what do I do? Well, uh, I don't know what you should do, but I mean, you should go to open mics, you should write, you should perform, you should record, right. you should do what is meaningful and make sense to you. But there's no way to uh, accurately, actively predict uh, you know, an outcome with any degree of certainty, because there's so many fantastic comedians who are not as like, let's say, known or financially successful as some of the people who are the most yeah. known. And, you know, we you can look at any number of people, whoever here, a quick, quick story that you reminded me of earlier, or I reminded myself of, um, my friend Shane Moss, a fantastic comedian who is doing a Vegas residency right now of a, a show all about psychedelics that I've seen and is fantastic. And he's a dear friend that I've known since for the past 20 years, since we both started in Boston one and years ago when we were less sure of ourselves uh, and as such, perhaps in the, the phase, this is, you reminded me of this when we were talking about the Pete Holmes scale of what that means yeah, for you yeah. as a comedian. 
And so for us, it was like carrot top, you know, a punchline, a joke, prop comedian who who likes that, you know, that's not quote unquote real for the comedy purist. But Shane was in Vegas years ago, you know, probably again, probably like 15 years ago, a few years into comedy. And he told me he's like he was performing, but he's like, somebody got me free tickets to see Carrot Top. So I was like, let's go. I'll go as a goof. And yeah. then afterwards, I talked to him. I was like, so how was the Carrot Top show? Right. You know, dish uh, spill the tea, a thing nobody said at the time. Um, and he was like, I have to admit it. He put on a really great show. Yeah, and, yeah. Like, <laughs> that's that's what that's what happens is like, I mean, yeah. I started out the same way, like in my limited world of what I thought was good. I loved Mitch Hedberg, loved Emo Phillips, loved Wendy Liebman, loved Stephen Wright, loved people with the kind of jokes that I was doing. And then it took, you know, people recommending, like people I looked up to being like, maybe expand your comfort zone. Like, yeah. I mean, try, di try doing different things, but also definitely try taking in different things. And now, like some of my favorite comedians are people who don't do anything like what I, some, some I'm like, oh wow, like, to watch someone and be like, how did you do that? How did you think of that? Like what, like to watch Joe Firestone be like, I don't, I mean, I do what I do and you do what you do. And like, I, if I had to do what you do, like, I don't, I wouldn't even know where to start. It's just right. because it's coming from an individual place. And so, yeah. So I think starting from a place where I was saying yes to every opportunity and saying yes to every joke and every idea. Like when I was growing up, I would to read a choose your own adventure. I would try to keep my fingers in every page because I wanted yeah. to experience every possibility. I want to read the right. whole book and I wanted to do that in life too. And I under, I understand eventually that that's not pop. You can't go left and right. You can't have a kid and not have a kid. You can't be in one relationship uh, and have it be monogamous and be in a different relationship. And so, yeah, that famously uh, doesn't work. Look at the Vanderpump <laughs> rules. Look at the Vanderpump rules drama that's all over the internet. Oh, right now. oh <laughs> I that's I'm not I'm not familiar, but I'll look into yeah, it after. Yeah, this. you're. I mean, listen, it's a thing. It's a thing. But it's exactly to the point that you're talking about. And and so I remember, you know, starting out. I, in a time when I was more like asking jokes than telling jokes, be like, you help me audience, like eventually getting to a place where I'm like, you know, I still, I still try things out on audiences. I still, but I'm like more confident in like, you know, who I am and what I want. And I, I don't need to say yes to every gig. I don't need to say yes to every opportunity because there's no, there's no secret right answer one way to do things, uh, except for every person. There is a secret right answer one way to do things, and uh, the secret right answer one way to do things was inside you the whole time. You know, like right. there's nobody else can tell you how to live your life or have your career or you know create your art. And so, I mean, that is one of like sort of the meta most rewarding things that I have discovered, which it's funny because I sort of came from a place where I was like delusionally self-confident in the beginning. I'm like, I believe yeah. I have things to say. And yeah. eventually audiences were like, are you sure? And I was like, I thought I was. And now I'm kind of back around or it, it always feels that way. But I'm like, yeah, now I'm more right about like now I have more history to draw on, more life experience, more like more ways to look back on that child version of myself, that child comedian and be like, oh, you really thought you knew what you were doing. And I really think I know what I'm doing. So we're not so different. You and me, past me and current me. Yeah, it's it was weirdly destiny that you're talking about a lot of the stuff that you're talking about, because in my own uh, comedy journey right now. And this is where I'm going to get a little bit selfish listeners. Cause I'm going to start asking Mike, like some very technical questions. So if you really like comedy, <laughs> like, strap in right now. So I've been doing comedy for seven years and it's funny when you're talking about when you start, you know, like the, when you start comedy, you're either doing structure or you have certain things you want to say, I'm the opposite of you. I was one of those people where I was always very clear about what I wanted to talk about, but like my classic problem you know, when I'm writing jokes is I have setups that are too long because I'll like go on and on and on and like telling the story. And it's just like, the better I get at comedy, the more I just like cut my setups down. You know, when I started, I would have, I would have a five minute, you know, you get five minutes set and I'd spend three of the five minutes setting up a punchline. Totally. Right? And I just had 
I just had a second baby. I'm married. I have two kids. I just had a second baby. And part of sort of an issue that I'm having in comedy or something that I'm doing is that because of the time I have in my personal life, and also I've been, I'm so targeted in what I talk about, I've had to approach comedy in a more targeted way. So I have been, I started writing a one woman show Been watching a lot of microbiblia. I'm going to go see Alex Edelman. He was on, he did this podcast. He's another guy who's got a one man show that's done really well. And sort of thinking about this whole approach to comedy where, because already in my headline hour, I talk about two main subjects. Mm -hmm. Uh, One is being a mom and the other one is that I'm white and Latina. And I talk, it's like half an hour on each. And I don't have like those million jokes that you're talking about, or it's like, so when you did, you know, this hour that you're talking about, did you do it more one man show style? Like, was it, did you have structured jokes throughout? Like, did you have laughs like every minute and a half or whatever it is? Or did you have, you know, so, sort of like the Nanette special where you have like these huge chunks where there's not laughter, where you're just doing like 10, 15 minutes of storytelling? Or how did you actually structure that sure, as a structure? comedian, the structured comedian that you are. Sure. Thank thank you for asking. I will say first, I feel like it's an interesting thing, just a brief interlude about Nanette that people are like, is it even comedy? And the answer is yes. Absolutely. And yeah. and it doesn't matter. And also if you go back and watch it, like I I think until the end, when she actively specifically spends time purposefully not getting a laugh to demonstrate the point that she's making yeah i feel like throughout the whole thing there is a laugh at least at least a laugh a minute probably many laughs a minute oh, like yeah. it's it's stand up the whole time oh yeah it's and, a stand up yeah. it is a clear stamp stand up structure until she gets to that part where it's not but it's like a clear yeah. divide and when she like decides to change the tone that's what yeah. i'm asking. like what are you doing with that yeah. Uh, so I would say that for the most part, my, you know, the shows that the show that I brought to Edinburgh uh, in 2018 and the show that I'm bringing there now, they are mainly hours of comedy. I do them in comedy clubs. Uh, yeah. And so for me, the main difference between, you know, uh, the, these themed hours and the previous and other hours that I do where I'm just like, jokes just uh, or whatever, or, you know, riffing or discovering things in the moment that the theme is the main that that everything you know sort of surrounds like the is gravitating towards or around this theme is the main difference like there there is a part at the end of the show that i'm doing this year where i read something that rini wrote and like there are some laughs in it but mainly yeah. it is to express the idea and i think that you you can even go back as far as Carlin and look at some of his specials and like you know there are times when he's like joke 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 there's times when he's just making absurd observations and like doing silly wordplay and then there's times where he's yelling at the government and it's funny and yeah. then there there are times when he's just doing things that I feel, feel like are more poetry and and I feel like this is another there's a the the Jewish uh text the Talmud uh has a a thing in it i believe by the about this rabbi zusha and zusha said something like on his deathbed he's like i'm not worried that god will judge me by saying why weren't you more like abraham why weren't you more like moses he's like i'm worried that god that god will judge me by saying why weren't you more like zusha and so i think that that's the way and there's a thing that lenny bruce once said he said i'm not a comedian i'm lenny bruce and I think that if you look at people like Reggie Watts, who I think is a brilliant Reggie Watts, like mm -hmm. he is in comedy, he is in music, he is in yeah. performance art, like eventually, like it's great to defy categorization. Like once you're like, yeah. people are going to see him because he's Reggie Watts, not because he's at a comedy club. Like that's, I feel yeah. like the biggest measure of success is when you don't even have to tell people what you do or who you are because who you are is what you do and people know you for it and will then uh, experience that. So that's all the context in here to say like, number one for you, like you're asking me how I do what I do in part to, you know, potentially ask yourself, how do I do what I do? How do I become who I am I, I, is what I'm hearing. And I mean, again, you have the answers and whenever I, whenever people ask me, like 
if they're preparing for like like a five minute audition set for like the Montreal Comedy Festival yeah. or a late night set, like my advice is always like try to do the most of these things possible. Uh, because it's five minutes, try to have, do you have jokes that are short? Mm -hmm. Do you have jokes that are uh, unique to you? Like, do you have jokes that, you know, that do you have jokes that you love? Do you have jokes that audiences love? Do you have jokes that like really give in that short amount of time, you know, uh, a description of who you are, uh, you know, and, and as many, if you can do all of that at once, I feel like that's, you know, you're bulletproof. And obviously, like, I feel like when you're doing a one person show, like, you don't need the jokes to be short, you don't yeah. need all of them to be short, you don't need any of them to be short. And, uh, and so I would just extract that, like, because if you're saying things, and when I, I've done like workshops for college kids and workshops for teenagers at a summer camp, yeah. to like, facilitate, I'm not like teaching them how to do comedy, I'm not teaching them how to write jokes. I'm like, facilitating and like sort of holding a space where I offer prompts. I'm like, I just ask questions like, what's different about you? What's the same about you? What's a thing that embarrasses you? What's the thing you're scared of or annoyed by? What's the thing that you love? What do you, what do you, what are you really passionate about? And then just, and then have them share whatever those things are. And then I'm like, when have you been funny? How have you been funny? Like in what, with, uh, what person are you funny think about that person think about telling them a story or what expressing an idea and however it comes out as you like there are long long swaths of carlin where like people are like he's often named as like one of the most influential comedians in the world and there are long swaths where he is not telling jokes or not getting laughs where he yeah. is just being george carlin because it doesn't matter that like he's that he's a comedian because he has transcended being a comedian. And right. I feel like the one person show structure and form offers that same, I mean, that's available to us all. Like we don't yeah. have to worry about being judged on somebody else's metrics. Uh, and so I would just say, yeah, like, I mean, number one, keep doing what you're doing. Number two, uh, like the thing that I do, so I, I won't tell you what to do, but, the thing that I do when I now start with an idea, like when I, sometimes I still just think of like a joke equation and I'm like, here it is, you know? And then I'll try my best to make those meaningful, you know? I'll try to, I'll try to make the, the, the form meaningful and then I'll try to bring form to the meaningful. If I'm starting with something meaningful, if I'm like, like this, the next hour that I'm planning after the one that I'm bringing to Edinburgh this year is potentially, I have two in mind, uh, one is about toxic masculinity. One is about my grandmother who just died a few years ago. And like with my grandmother, sometimes she just said funny things. And I'm just like sharing those things and talking about my relationship to her. Uh, with the the idea of masculinity and my relationship to it, I'm like, I know what I think about it. And and I'm finally at a place where I'm like, I I have things that I want to say about it. I have ideas. And so I'll just go on stage with those ideas and then kind of, you know, without a without a net be like this I, is this just funny by itself this idea no well then i guess i have to add things to it i have to add punchlines which i'll try to do on stage and try to do off stage of course in right. writing but like if i know where i'm heading i do my best to like add as many like punches to the setups as possible and yeah. sometimes they become their own thing like even years ago i had this joke about i think i came up with this word i was like uh, i just put two words together made a portmanteau of sam i am and ambulance and i'm like the sam i ambulance and i thought that was just a fun uh, i'm like that's fun i was like and i built like a joke around it that eventually didn't even include it like i think on my first album like there's a joke about dr seuss rhymes with it, it ended up being about like you know how people say Beer before liquor, never sicker. Liquor before beer, you're in the clear. And the main premise became like, you know, great rhymes to teach yourself how to not die, you know, using yeah, yeah. using child's poetry uh, to address the most, you know, your your alcoholism, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, an adult challenge. And right. but eventually, like that, the thing that got me there, like the catalyst uh, wasn't even didn't even fit in the joke anymore. And I'm like, well, that it served its purpose. And so 
I feel like that's a thing that I, I like to do now is to be open to like, this is what I think the joke is about now. This is what I think, and it can work on the micro or macro level. This is what I think the hour is about, or this is what I think the bit is about. And then I just, you know, keep adding to it and then keep uh, eventually, my girlfriend refers to uh, the, the stages of uh, working on an hour of comedy for me as the, uh, the blooming phase and the pruning phase. And so the blooming phase yeah. is like, allow you know plant all the seeds water them yes. all allow it all to grow create a massive jungle and then eventually be like for a bit to be it's fin in its finished form or as i'm about to record it for the whole special for the whole hour to be that prune it you know bloom and prune yeah. and like sort of you know inhaling and exhaling like do one do the other do do them both at the same time if you can yeah and so yeah i feel like it does sound like you've got i mean you have topics that are meaningful and personal and unique to your life experience. You have stories that nobody else has because they're your life and you share those things. And yeah, I feel like just, you know, as you continue to develop, you know, uh, experience and the comedy skills as you, as you want and as you can, like, I mean, the answer to your question for how you do it will, you know, you're, you're the wise person on top of the mountain that you're climbing to ask how to do it, you know? <laughs> And do you use, like, what do you really work on when you've got, like, your comedy? Do you, where do you live? Do you live in, do you live in New York? I live in Brooklyn, New York. Okay. So when you're, like, just doing spots in the city, yes. what do you, are you just working on pieces of that hour? Or are you working on individual jokes? Or, like, when you're just doing spots around, what exactly are you working on? Sure. You don't have, like, the hour that you're going to have at Arlington Draft House, which I'm going to ask you about in a minute. But Yes, of, of course. Um, so I, I, th I kind of stumbled into this the way that it works now by in part sort of going back to the way that I, I used to be, which I still kind of am, which is like, I don't want to do just one thing forever. And like, you know, as it manifests in my relationship, I'm like, great news. I'm not the same forever. She's not the same forever. We get to continue to grow individually and grow collectively. And so it was kind of like the thing that I used to think of like only being with one person forever can't do that. I'm like, that's not, there's a thing in Buddhism. They say like the same person can't step into the same river twice because you can look, look at the river. Obviously the water that's there flowing right now is not the water that's there one second later. And we are also like those rivers, but I didn't even think until now, like of that analogy specifically to like, yeah, the same two people are not in the same relationship forever. Like yeah. we are constantly flowing and growing. I'm a flower and a grower. Mm -hmm. And and so to answer your question is right now, I have the hour that is for all intents and purposes, quote unquote, done. I mean, it still gets tweaked here and there, but I've been working on this one since at least, I've been done, done versions of it since 2018 or 2019. And is the one that you're bringing here to Arlington Draft House in July? Okay. Uh, for the most part, yes. I mean, here's the thing. When I come to, uh, when I do a comedy club now, sometimes like the early show has to be shorter. Like I think at, at Arlington Draft House, I'm doing like one show each night, but some of the nights there's another, uh, I think one night I'm doing early, one night I'm doing late. Okay. And so if it's the early show and it needs to be 45 minutes because they have to turn over the room, then I might not do the hour I'm bringing to Edinburgh because it has to be it, it has to be at least 55 minutes to an hour, okay. but I'll, I'll definitely do it at least two out of the three nights. But like, if I'm going to like a club where I'm doing, I don't know, one show Thursday, two Friday, two Saturday, I'll often do, like I was just in Knoxville, Tennessee last weekend mm -hmm. and I did two shows Friday, two shows Saturday. And the late show Saturday, I did the Edinburgh set and all three other ones I did like one of them had a very small audience, so I just riffed a lot and like did, you okay. know, did bits here and there, talked to the audience, uh, you know, told them some jokes, but mainly had that be like a more curated experience to the circumstances. Okay. Whereas the early show on Friday, I did like the newer hour, the hour that will be like the next curated hour, which is not done yet, which is still like floating and flowing and I'm, you know, making new parts of it and finding new discoveries and new connections all of the time. Right. And so when I'm in, when I, and so, and that's kind of the way that it's been for the past, at least 
five to seven years that I'll have one hour that's in almost finished form and another hour that's in like a very like embryonic state or, you know, some somewhere along the line. So it's sort of like kind of I mean, this is not the most artistic way to describe it, but an assembly line where, you know, as they head towards like finished product dumb, like one of them is f the farthest along. One of them is like, I can, I go to a club and I'm excited to do this hour. And then one of them is like ideas that aren't done yet, or, you know, it's only 15 minutes and not yet an hour. But so when I'm doing sets around New York, for the most part, I'm no longer doing any part of the hour that I'll bring to Arlington and that I'll bring to Edinburgh for sure. Like that hour on, almost only gets worked on now when I'm doing it as the hour. But I remember specifically like sometime, I think just before the pandemic or maybe just after, but I think it was before, like probably I've been working on this show for like a year or two I had, but it wasn't yet what it would become. And like, there's some callbacks at the end of the show that require like many jo you know, jokes to be told throughout it. And so at a certain point, it got to the point where I couldn't do it. I couldn't do the closer of the show in a 15 minute set because I couldn't do everything that was necessary to lead up to it in a 15 minute set. And I remember having that experience where I was like, oh, I'm going to have to run the light or not do the whole thing. I'm going to have to. So at that point, I might still have done like little chunks of it here and there. But now, mostly when I'm doing sets, you know, a 5, 10, 15, 20 minute set even, I'm mostly doing like stuff from the next hour or stuff that will become or, you know, or brand new things, things that I'm excited about right now that will become like, you know, three specials from now that I'm right, not right. sure. Yeah, right. More of the embryonic state is what you're working yes, on. Yes, exactly. But it's pretty cool that I don't think I've ever seen anybody do this, but, you know, when you come to a comedy club, like when you're coming here, you if somebody were to see you, because sometimes people will want to stay for both shows. I have seen that for several comics. And people don't realize like it's the same like you're going to see the same show twice but with you that's not necessarily true they could see like two totally different shows yeah and that's i impressive. it's thank you it's i mean it's coming from in part a selfish place but also you know we we all benefit there's here's two things one carlin once said something like i'm here for me you're here for me no <laughs> one's here for you and <laughs> I think that's funny and also it doesn't completely resonate with me because uh like I'm I'm certainly here for me and I'm here for you. It's not a it's right. not uh a competition. It's and that's the beautiful thing. You're are you familiar with Ramdas the spiritual teacher? Uh familiar, but I'm So Ramdas he is he died a few years back, but he was like did you know Timothy Leary was like a famous like psychedelic researcher at Harvard that got fired for I think doing psychedelics. Yeah. And, I saw him in a documentary or yeah, yeah, I know who you're talking about. Yes. And so Ram Dass at the time was just known by his uh, birth name, Richard Alpert. And he also worked at Harvard and worked with Timothy Leary and wow. didn't get fired, but eventually quit and discovered and started seeking, uh, you know, something greater, something more meaningful than yeah. he had achieved everything according to the American dream and wasn't happy. And he's like, yeah. so that can't be it. And, you know, found psychedelics, found, you know, uh, spiritual paths from Buddhism and Hinduism and then sort of became his own thing. And a thing that he said that I really like is uh, the best something I'm paraphrasing, but he said, like, the best thing that I can do for you is work on myself. Oh. And and so I think that, you know, the best thing uh, actively, the best thing a comedian can do for an audience is work on their act, is work on themselves. Like, Ooh. you don't I don't work on an audience's life. I work on my own experience. And so it ends up being that the thing that I love doing, like if I, I would say optimally, if I'm going to a town to do two shows Friday, two shows Saturday, one of the shows I do the done thing, which in some ways is not less for me, but I'm like, it's, I'm now presenting like, this is the work that past me worked so hard on that I've done. And then the other show is like, this is the one that I'm still constantly, currently, you know, working on and experimenting and trying new things. It's, there's a poem, I, no, not a, there's a poet named Robert Haas who said a thing I love. He says, repetition makes us feel secure. Variation makes us feel free. And so both of those are sort of necessary. That is the truest thing about comedy, you know? Yeah. 
Like right. it's easy to do the jokes you already know, right? But, and you know, you're going to get the laughs and sure, like you feel safe, like getting big laughs, but like the amazing stuff, there's nothing like when something new works. Exactly. And, and you can't, you can't have, I mean, you wouldn't have anything if you didn't try something new. You, Absolutely. Because, and, but yeah, of course, you know, we know there's, there's certainly comedians who throughout the decades, and I think it's changing more now, but like there were some comedians who you could see 20 years ago and you can see him tomorrow and they'll be doing basically the same thing. And they're, and in some ways I feel like that is doing a service. They're like, they created this beautiful thing and they're providing it to people who might enjoy it. But for me, like, that's the part that I'm like, I gotta do, I gotta do something new sometime for me and for, and I've, I'm grateful that I figured out a way to try new things in a way that I think is also enjoyable to people watching it in part because the comedy audiences have been working on themselves. They, you know, with all the podcasts that are out there, with all the interviews, with all the information you can gather as like a comedy fan, a comedy nerd, a comedy savvy individual, like there are people who are part specifically like promoting shows as like workshopping, like, you know, Sometimes Maria Bamford, one of my favorites, will just be like, you know, come on out and like, hear me try brand new things and help me. You'll be helping me. And then getting to see that, it's like, it's like a thing that didn't exist, you know, when, you know, in the 80s, like if or whenever you would just like, oh, you could only see the finished product. Yeah. And now getting to see behind the scenes and then later getting to see the in front of the scenes, like it's. It's a wonderful, you know, I think beautiful progression that has occurred and is occurring still. Absolutely. Absolutely. And on that note, we want to thank Mike Kaplan for being on. I'm going to do the podcast voice. <laughs> <laughs> we want to thank Mike Kaplan for being on our show and the Arlington Draft House podcast. This was awesome. Um, I'm so excited to see you. He's going to be here July 6th, 7th, and 8th. Um, at the Arlington Draft House, you can get tickets on Arlington Draft House. You can just Google it and get tickets that way. Um, and you can come see him twice. And maybe the hours will be different if you come see him twice. Uh, so thank you so much for being on here. And uh, this will be out, you know, a little bit before the show. Thank you so much for having me. Can I say one more thing or are we still? Uh, oh, say one more thing. Is... P.S. The after after the credits. Uh, uh -huh. I'm Of course, thanks for coming to see me in Arlington and obviously following me on social media. We'll find out where else I might be. But uh, I also wanted to let people know that I have a new special out on Dry Bar right now. Just came out uh, in the past week or weeks, depending when you're listening to this. It's called Live from the Universe. And if you uh, go on Drybar's website, you can put in the code, the promo code, Mike Kaplan, spelled the weird way I spell it, M-Y-Q-K-A-P-L-A-N, and get a free month's worth of Drybar subscription to see that. And that is also a completely different half hour than anything you'll see me doing live these days. Amazing. Amazing. Well, thank you again. Everybody, you. have a great day.